Greetings, College Language Association members, and welcome to the CLA Member Circle. I'm Gervette Ward, the incoming 2022-2024 CLA President. I am honored to introduce two new initiatives, CLA Member Circle and CLA Member Circle Presents. Both can be found on our website, www.clascholars.org. The CLA Executive Committee launched CLA Member Circle and CLA Member Circle Presents in response to the need to postpone the 2022 National Convention. We, like many of you, were deeply sad that we weren't able to gather in person this year. But we wanted to provide opportunities to keep us together, even as so many factors keep us apart. In addition, the Executive Committee has been looking for ways to maintain member engagement outside of our annual convention. The CLA Member Circle is an online scholarly social community where active and financial CLA members can share, work, and connect with other members by interests, network, forums, and more. Each CLA Standing Committee has a member circle where they can gather and work, and all CLA members are free to create additional circles for collaboration and gathering. We hope that you will utilize this space for deeper CLA connections for years to come. In addition, we are offering regularly scheduled events and activities as part of CLA Member Circle Presents. From movie screenings to writing workshops, trivia nights, poetry panels, and Zumba classes, all of these and more are part of CLA Member Circle Presents. We also invite you to visit the CLA website to submit suggestions for additional events. On behalf of the entire CLA Executive Committee, we hope that these new initiatives will provide the perfect bridge until we can gather in person for our 81st annual CLA convention in Atlanta, April 5th through 8th, 2023, hosted by Emory University with the keynote address from Pulitzer Prize winner, Jericho Brown. Please visit our website and social media pages for more information and for the list of upcoming Member Circle Presents events. Thank you for your membership and welcome to the CLA Member Circle. Wonderful. So uh, just want to echo that welcome from our current vice president and incoming president. Um, just to say thank you all so much for coming this evening to participate in this very exciting event. Um, this is, of course, our second event as a part of Member Circles Presents. You've already heard a brief introduction into what this series of programming is about, and we are really excited to be able to count this among the number. We wanted to be able to not only have events where we could engage with one another socially and in building that community, but we really wanted to, to prioritize some events that would allow us to really showcase some of the amazing scholars that we have in the CLA community. Our original plan for this weekend, of course, was to be at our annual convention, which we've had to postpone to next year. Jericho Brown will still be our keynote speaker for the 2023 convention, but we thought it fitting to spend a little bit of time on what would have been the weekend we would have been having him as our keynote in celebrating his work and in thinking a bit about his contributions, not only as a Pulitzer Prize winner, thank you very much, um, but also <laughs> as a scholar and as a great uh, poet who has been contributing to our community in many ways for many, many years. Uh, thankfully, Dr. Joanne Gavin agreed, uh, and didn't even put up much of a fight at all uh, <laughs> to gather and, and organize these wonderful panelists that we have. And so I'm really excited to be able to introduce to you all this partnership with Furious Flower Poetry Center uh, and Dr. Joanne Gavin, who will introduce her uh, fellow panelists and I will yield the floor to her. Thank you, Dr. Gavin. Uh, thank you, McKinley. McKinley is a part of us at Furious Flower, and uh, he didn't have to twist my arm at all to do this. I am delighted to be here with my uh, sister panelists, 
And also to say to you, congratulations on coming up with this idea of the CLA member circle. I think it's great that you are doing this to continue the community that we so miss. All year long, we look forward to CLA and not having it, there's a void. So uh, I'm really, really excited to be here and participate in this um, panel called Rage and Resilience in the Poetry of Jericho Brown. I think the, probably the best way to get going is to hear his voice. So McKinley, if you will play just a little bit of um, Jericho Brown, he's reading tradition. The tradition, aster, nasturtium, delphinium. We thought fingers in dirt meant it was our dirt, learning names and heat in elements classical philosophers said could change us. Stargazer, foxglove. Summer seemed to bloom against the will of the sun, which news reports claimed flamed hotter on this planet than when our dead fathers wiped sweat from their necks. Cosmos, baby's breath. Men like me and my brothers filmed what we planted for proof we existed before too late. Sped the video to see blossoms brought in seconds. Colors you expect in poems where the world ends Everything cut down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Mike Brown. We are going to take a poetic journey through Jericho, not the biblical city, of the palms, but through the land of Jericho, where flowers bloom until men appear, their vulnerable bodies exposed to the violence they did not expect or deserve. We are going to take a journey with the Jericho Brown, a southerner a black queer man who knows the road signs that say, get out, <laughs> turn around, safe to go, stop. We're going on a journey around the proverbial walls of Jericho that were built again and again because of age old rage and stubborn resilience. Let me tell you about Jericho, the subject of our inspiration. Jericho Brown is a brilliant poet, a masterful teacher, and a gardener whose tools are the blues, the guzzle, the sonnet, the couplet, and his invented form, the duplex. We are really, really fortunate to have a clip of Lauren Elaine reading a, a duplex that she wrote recently as a part of the collegiate summit that we had at James Madison University. And she was encouraged to do this duplex because of our wonderful teacher for that particular summit, Douglas Kearney. So if you would, at this point, McKinley, play that clip uh, that Lauren Aline sent us. 
She couldn't be here with us tonight because she has another engagement, but um, she has come to us virtually. Good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry that I'm unable to join you in person tonight to celebrate the work of the amazing Jericho Brown, but I just wanted to make a small offering to the conversation. At the recent Fierceval Collegiate Summit, I sat in on a workshop facilitated by Douglas Kearney in which he lectured on the duplex, the now famous form created by our very own Jericho Brown. Kearney pointed out the form's engine of repetition, repeating lines coming back over and over, both themselves and still changed because, as he pointed out, return to point A after a journey through B, C, and D is not actually a return to A, but an arrival at an A necessarily inflected by everything that has come before it. A would basically never be the same. And that unlocked the duplex for me. I love form. I'd wanted to try one. And something about that positioning of the form just made this poem emerge. It was my first duplex. And in it, the form becomes a vehicle that enacts my immigrant experience. The repetition of the prior line is like the past, insisting on itself, refusing to be left behind. And it's coupled with the urgency of forging ahead, still trying to be and make something new. I love when I find a form that fits the questions that I have. And I offer this poem tonight in gratitude and celebration of this instructive and innovative form and this impressive contribution to the craft of poetry. Immigrant Duplex for Douglas Kearney, after Jericho Brown. What questions might the world ask of me after I have buried myself whole? I have buried myself in the whole of America, its plastic freedoms, elastic unfreeness. America, you have rendered me a corpse of delightful emptiness. You have plundered me of heft, ground the God in me to tin and clatter, God the grind, the death din and rattle of markets, marching, everything for sale marked. I bought my own drum to march to. It hangs around my neck like a price tag made of history. My neck stuck out for no one. What questions might the world ask of me? Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. What a beautiful poem. The duplex was the inspiration. And Lauren Aline is professor of English at James Madison University. And I'm so pleased to have her as the assistant director of the Furious Flower Poetry Center. So we have a program lined up for you this evening. Three brilliant sisters who are going to talk about rage and resilience in the poetry of Jericho Brown. First, my literary sister friend, Maida Dewa Jones. She authored The Muse is Music, jazz poetry from the Harlem Renaissance to the spoken word. It was awarded the MLA William Sanders Scarborough Prize. She also has a manuscript coming, Black Alchemy, which is a hybrid work of poetry, theory, and memoir that explores collaborations between writers and visual artists as they map memories of and travels within the African diaspora. Joan's creative scholarship focused on African-American literature and inter-arts 
has been published in diverse venues. So many I shouldn't name, but I'll name a few. The, uh, she has also been supported by uh, fellowships from the National Humanities Center, the Schlesinger Library at Harvard University, the Moreland Spengarn Research Center at Harvard University, and uh, Rockefeller, Woodrow Wilson, and Mellon Foundations. I'd like to also say she contributed a wonderful chapter to uh, our book, book edited by Lauren Elaine and myself, called The String of Grace, Renovating New Rhythms in the Present Future of Poetry, published in Furious Flowers, Seeding the Future of African-American Poetry. She's also a devoted and loved member of the Furious Flower Advisory Board. So much more to say, but I'll stop there. Our next speaker will be Bettina Judd. Dr. Judd is an interdisciplinary writer, artist, and performer whose research focus is on Black women's creative production and her use of visual art, literature, and music to develop feminist thought. Her current book manuscript argues that Black women's creative production is feminist knowledge production produced by registers of effect that she calls feeling. She has received fellowships from the five colleges, the Vermont Studio Center, and the University of Maryland. She is a Kaveh Kahnem Fellow and has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize in Poetry. Her poems have also appeared in numerous um, journals and anthologies, too many to talk about now. Her collection of poems titled Patient is a book that tackles the history of medical experimentation on and display of Black women. As a performer, she has been invited to perform for audiences in Vancouver, Washington, DC, Atlanta, Paris, New York, and Mumbai. She is currently the assistant professor of gender, women and sexuality studies at the University of Washington. And our final panelist is poet, author, critic, Opal Moore, who has been educated at the Illinois Wesleyan University and the University of Iowa. She has been a beloved faculty member at Virginia Commonwealth University, Hollins College, and Spelman College. She was also the advisor for Bettina Dudd at Spelman. She is uh, the author of Lot's Daughter, her collection, her collection of poems, and uh, she has been included in Carol Lou, uh, Connecticut Review, Honey Hush, and Shaping Memories, Reflections of African-American Women Writers. Uh, she is also a founding member of the Wintergreen Women Writers Collective. She too has been a part of the Furious Flower Advisory Board, and when she was on the board, she was chair of the board. So sit back, relax, maybe not too much because you're going to be agitated by what these women bring to you. And I mean agitated intellectually. So get your questions ready. If we have a few moments at the end, we certainly want questions to come from you. So first, please, Meta, take it away. First, I want to begin by saying, let me set my timer. Give me just a second. Um, while I'm doing that, I want to say thank you so much to McKinley Meltland, to Joanne Gabin, 
to Javette Ward, to the CLA and Furious Flower community coming together. It's an honor to be on this panel with Opal and Bettina and uh, and Lauren and um, Lauren in her absence. Uh, and next, I'm going to go ahead and screen share. Oops, excuse me. My um, timer dropped. I'm going to screen share my slide. You can probably hear I'm a little under the weather. Um, and so if uh, my voice fades a bit, I know I'm with family and community. So just, just bear with me. Give me just one second and I will screen share my slideshow. <laughs> Wait, where did it go? I had it all pulled up beef. There we go, <laughs> before we begin. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. I'm gonna wait to press play. You can see my application so that um, we'll start from the beginning so it wouldn't um, I'll go to our very beginning and then we'll begin. So resilience was originally in my title when I was asked to participate with um, everyone many moons ago. But after I saw that Opal also had resilience in the title of her talk, um, we were talking about resilience in rage in her abstract, I decided to focus more on the, co co uh, the caress. So begin again. Queer Echoes is caress in Jericho Brown's aesthetic of love, craft and community. So two words that I want to emphasize in my presentation today are love and community, in part because craft is what Jericho Brown, in essence, is partially lauded so much for, right? His ability to be such a kind of craft person, you know, wordsmith is a word that often gets used a lot. And so I'd like to use another word. He's a word jewelry maker, right? He literally makes to use Rita does term, a bracelet of the lyric, a bracelet of song, um, and takes out of the violence, I would say, of the history of the African diaspora shackles and turns it into um, a gold band that connects us in love and community, not in cockles and in chains. So Lauren's discussion of the duplex set me up beautifully. Um, I won't have time today to go as much into the duplex form, the famous form invented by Jericho Brown, um, but I wanted to start actually, I have begin again, the beginning at the ending, not the beginning of the tradition. Duplex cento is the last cento in, included in Jericho Brown's uh, The Tradition. And there are a couple of lines from this that I want to emphasize because they start to tell a story a story that Jericho tells, but I'd like to argue that not only does Jericho Brown tell the story about this Chinto and other um, um, stories in the duplex, but he engages in a bit of storying, storytelling. And so I'm gonna try and tell an alternative story of love here while we move through uh, some of his points. Duplex Chinto. My last love drove a burgundy car, color of a rash, a symptom of sickness. We were the symptoms, the road of our sickness. None of our fights ended where they began. And we'll jump all, all the way down to the end. Steadfast and awful, my tall father was my first love. He drove a burgundy car. The echo, the caress of love and love repeated here, but torqued differently. Both drive a burgundy car, except the burgundy here um, wants me have it rift with step Faust and awful in relationship to the larger stories that Jericho Brown tells, not only about love and its intimacy, but domestic abuse and the intimacy between violence, the aestheticization of that violence and the subversion and resistance of that through refrain and through revisiting it for a form of communal and poetic healing. My last love, my first love, let's go to his first duplex which takes us not to love, but to home. A poem is a gesture toward home. It makes dark demands I call my own. Memory makes demands darker than my own. My last love drove a burgundy car. Here, 
before we get to the kind of the echo, the repeat, and I'm using echo both as a larger metaphor, the echoing of the line, hear it again, but also as a literal technical device in the duplex where we hear it and repeat a loop uh, anew. A poem is a gesture to cut, uh, towards home, although it's not pictured here, those who know the duplex form by Brown, many of you here are familiar with it already, know that he ends with that same line that he begins. A poem is a gesture toward home. What does it mean to search for home as a form of community? What does it mean for Black people, for Black poets, for Black writers, for Black queer writers, for a Black gay man to search for home through poetics, to make a form, a gesture of love, a gesture of community? Sometimes that home is fractured. Here we see at the end of the first half of this duplex form, this is not the end of the full poem, I'm only picturing part of it here. Um, Steadfast and awful, my tall father hit hard as a hailstorm, he'd leave marks. The burgundy car is burgundy, not as a car, but as a bruise, right? What does it mean when home leaves bruise marks? And how do you use poetry to reform, reshape, revisit in your own truth that hurt that haunts from home, from family, from the place called as the Black family or as community? I said Jericho Brown did a bit of storing, and so now I want to tell a different story about home and a different story about love that Jericho tells himself. And that's first, Echo and caress. Concepts of my aesthetic approach here. Echo was rejected by narcissists, but not to fear, although he opens the tradition with the myth of Ganymede, the myth of narcissists and Echo's rejection, the trailing voice, the voice of mourning, um, is something that is embraced, if not the myth in full, certainly the formal implications of the voice, which is why his first book or collection, please, not pictured here, but I have here in my hand, begins with, the subheader, repeat, begins with a woman in song, right? Echo, a sound that repeats, that reverberates, that reflects across the waves. Not just sound waves, but the wave of breath. Anyone, everyone who's hair Jericho read knows, and thanks for that snippet, that he doesn't just read or recite poems, he what? Breathes them. His breath across the waves calling us into community, calling us into caress, a gentle touch, often repeated. Care, care and cider crest, the labor of care that Jericho Brown evinces, that labor of craft to every word, every sound, every breath to call us into community. Here, I want us to think about caress as keepsake and hear a queer echo of community in a black woman's voice, voiced through Jericho Brown's voice. And since no one can read Jericho the way Jericho reads Jericho, I thought it would be fun for the CLA community to hear Jericho reciting June Jordan. I'm arguing here while you listen to a part of this clip from him is that when he holds, you'll see in a minute, a slip of paper with June Jordan's voice scribbled on it, that he's holding up a keepsake. And I'll play, I'll start here. But what I'm holding in my hand is a poem by June Jordan. Uh, and it's a poem that I've kept with me for I would say the last 21, maybe 23 years. And uh, it went from a bunch of wallets. You know, I was that person who always had a wallet that was this thick. <laughs> and uh, it would go back and forth between wallets to, uh, to cork boards on the wall or to just, <laughs> just uh, you know, that part in the dresser where you stick a piece of paper over the, in the mirror, uh, between the mirror and its border. And uh, it's a poem that I've loved a long time. And what I really love about this poem is that uh, it shows us a lot about who June Jordan is. Before we get to the poem, what I really love about this clip, do you see the caress, the way he holds that sheet of paper up, the way even when he talks about pinning it to the corkboard, he's pinning for us, the audience, that slip of paper of June Jordan's voice, that poem, up in the air for us to join in community, to hail. What I love about this clip 
of his love of June Jordan is that he uses the word love as he grasps his keep, keepsake. In the interest of time, I have to scroll uh, towards the end so we can hear a snippet of him reading it. And then we're gonna see the poem that he actually recites. Really interested in was connection, was touch. So I'm gonna read you this poem and I'm gonna read it from this slip of paper that I just pulled out of a mirror <laughs> in, in, a, in, the, in the bedroom. Uh, these poems, these poems, they are things that I do in the dark, reaching for you, whoever you are. And are you ready? These words, they are stones in the water running away. These are skeletal lines. They are desperate arms for my longing and love. I am a stranger learning to worship the strangers around me, whoever you are, whoever I may become. Who are we? And what we're going to turn to, oops, excuse me, one second, I have to. Who are we when we listen to Jericho Brown? How do we become in community? We come not only through seeing, but listening to his grand scale echo of June Jordan's words. What I love about the way that Jericho reads, recites, breathes, caresses June Jordan's words is that he breathes it differently, right? His rhythm of breathing, his cadence of breath, his cadence of love is different than how he reads his own poems, right? And you can hear in that a queer echo that may be a formal echo, but not a sonic echo in the literal definition that's often used for echo. The sound itself does not literally repeat or reverberate, reverberate, but the idea of these words, longing and love at the, oops, excuse me, um, um, in the third stanza of these poems does. When I say there's a different story or storytelling that I'm offering for us today about Jericho Brown, it's that, that while the duplex may tell us that his first love and his fat last love is father love, right? Or lover love, right? Here we see, to quote the title of Rita Dove's book, not only mother love, June Jordan as a queer mother, June Jordan as a beautiful black ancestor, June Jordan, whose longing and love links up in community with Jericho Brown. What does it mean to hold a keepsake for 20 to 21 years, a poem in the wallet, right? And I think about the way that he describes that wallet. And it reminds me of a moment in another Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Natasha Trethewey's opening to letter home. There's that word again, home, in which she talks about Ophelia searching, right? Ophelia in letter home. Ophelia says, you know, four weeks have passed since I've left and still I find no work. And then she gets to a line where she says, my purse thins. Well, I'm gonna tell you, if you're carrying a poem by June Jordan or Jericho Brown in your pocket, your wallet or your purse will never go thin. It will be fat and it will be thick. I'm gonna turn now to riff on this notion of home, to answer this question that I asked about the corrects. Now, why duplex as a title for his invented form? I'd like to argue, and I pulled this up deliberately, I mean this ironically, I mean it somewhat sardonically. What is a duplex? I didn't go to the Poetry Foundation website. I went to just a real estate website to see that much of the language of the duplex is housed in ideas of heteronormative um, living. What is a detached single family home? What is a single family? What does detachment mean or signify if it's moded as the dream for many? And what does that mean if we're thinking about QT pop family, LGBTQIA family, um, specifically when we consider for both all Black people in the community, the struggle to find home, to have home, to own home, to be housed, period, and the disproportionate rate of 
unhoused nest, right, um, among queer Black family. I think that what's beautiful about the duplex form and that gesture to her home, it's a gesture away from this very structure of framing um, a duplex in conventional terms. Lastly, as I move towards the end, I've got just two minutes left. I wanna play just a little bit of the beginning of what I'm calling here, as you can see on my screen, the uncaress or the anti-caress. And I'm doing that because Jericho Brown's early work, um, not just Please, but the New uh, Testament works with, um, and does so, he does so in the tradition as well, but even more so obviously in the New Testament. Um, and Prayer of the Backhanded comes from her first collection, Please, thinking about the black church, its ritual, rituals, right? But also thinking about poem as prayer and as an offering in relationship to the uncaress that he mentions here. I'm not gonna have time to play the whole poem. I'm just gonna play a little bit of it. Oh, it took me back to the beginning, so let's see. Prayer, so prayer of the backhanded. Not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor his closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna stop screen sharing to say I'm right, I'm literally 30 seconds over. So um, just to say this, given the discussion of the slap heard around the world, given the framing of physical slapping and the various debates over its significance and the spectacle of it, that is made into an uncaress and an anti-caress, who better, what better way to get us to think about how to call into community, how to bring back the intimate space of air, of breath, than asking a poet like Jericho Brown to take on this topic of the backhanded slap in the space of the poem as prayer. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, Meta, wonderful, fantastic. Thank you. Bettina, go for it. Right. Thank you so much. And Meta, we must have been on the same brainwave frequency because I'll be talking a little bit about duplex cento and Yay. touch and wow. um, so much. So I'm. I, I, say that to also say that I'm in awe of everyone on this panel. Um, as uh, Dr. Gavin said, um, you know, I'm here on this panel with my former senior advisor, <laughs> um, Opal Moore, um, who actually made it possible for me to come to my first Furious Flower Conference in 2004. I, I didn't even know that I was on any faculty's radar as somebody who was a poet, was so interested in poetry to want to go to a conference about it. And, and she and Professor Sharon Strange made it possible for me and two other um, students to, to go to that Furious Flower Conference in 2004. And, and I tell you, it was absolutely life-changing for me um, uh, as a poet and, and as someone who uh, decided to be more dedicated to poetry um, after that. So thank you. Um, I also uh, want to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Gavin, for, for calling on me to be in this, in this circle. Um, uh, definitely. Uh, um, full of gratitude because I get to talk about someone who is absolutely dear to me as a person um, in Jericho Brown, um, one of li literally one of my favorite people <laughs> in the in the world, and um, uh, it's 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 almost an out of body experience to talk about him in this in this kind of way. Um, so one, I'm going to 
go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully you are able to, to see this. Um, the, the title um, starting out uh, to this is to be fragile like a flower, reframing resilience in the poetry of Jericho Brown. And I'd come to this title after thinking that the title that I really wanted to um, start with or the like the pre colon I really wanted to have was touching Jericho Brown, but I thought that too, too provocative. And I think a lot of people can be super forward with with Jericho in a way I don't like and maybe I'm just being, you know, territorial or something. <laughs> you know, get your hands off my friend. Um, so this, um, so I'm going to start here um, with uh, to be fragile like a flower and this this image that that flanks the back is a is a painting of mine after a poem that is one of Jericho Brown's favorite poets, um, Lucille Clifton, um, following the bright black of the woman, the the bright back of the woman that is the title of this piece. Um, um, as I'm thinking through um, Lucille Clifton's uh, midrash around the Garden of Eden, um, and so this is a converse, kind of a conversation. These are the beginnings of a kind of like internal conversation that I'm having with Jericho. Um, one would think that of the senses on which Jericho Brown seems to rely, to return to, to revel in, hearing and sound would be primary. After all, his first collection, Please, functions as an eight-track player, fully functional with sections uh, titled Repeat, Pause, Power, and finally Stop. The book could function also as a mar an archive of Motown history as much as a collection of poems. When the book dropped in 2008, JerichoBrown.com opened with an Adobe splash animation revealing the arresting book cover. Sepia and orange tinted, a man's lips parted enough to reveal teeth and tongues slightly lifted behind them. And with this reveal, the voice of James Brown in the first three seconds of his 1956 hit, Please, Please, Please. Trust me when I say that this is where touch in this talk comes in, through the haptic of sound. James Brown's isolated vocals that make melodic the begging plea and refrain of this hit with the famous flames are arresting on their own. The sound emerges from no sound before any guitar, piano, bass, drum, horns, or the background singers could even catch up. We are drawn in by this earnest sound of good begging music through its riff uh, from nothingness as the timber, the nakedness of, of James Brown's voice reverberates. We want to answer, to give him whatever he wants, for his love to come back. Whatever has brought him to this bare emotional state must be tended. The haptic of this kind of touch to the listener can't be disregarded. But if missed, we might come to another form of touch embedded in the song. There is legend, according to Bob Merlis, that Little Richard penned the title, Please, 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 on a napkin, and James Brown went on to write the lyrics. What are the circumstances of collaboration and camaraderie between Little Richard and James Brown that result in Little Richard writing Please three times on a napkin? Was the napkin given to Brown or even intended for him? What events might have transpired? What words said for the moment to be frozen in time by the subsequent song? Here we have a moment of speculative intimacy between two men at the vanguard of Black music genres, rock and roll, soul, R&B, and eventually funk. A touch emblazoned by the intimacy of the napkin and its haptic use to wipe errant food from around the face, to wipe the hands, to recover from a sneeze, and here to beg, please. 
pardon me for going on about this, but there's one final way in which touch is made possible through this sound of the song, please, 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 at least in the context of this book. And that is James Brown's record of domestic violence. The begging genre of R&B is haunting in this way for those who have witnessed to or been witnessed to or been uh, subject to domestic violence situations. Please is the plea of the beaten, as in please stop. The book makes this particular plea where the last section stop is the marker of an ending rather, in a, that rather than a full section in itself. Speaking back to the title page, Please is also the plea of the violent aggressor, asking for forgiveness, for another chance. It is all these matters, oops, it is all these matters of touch, the haptic of sound itself, male intimacy, and physical violence that makes touch the undercurrent theme of the book that intentionally sings to us. Touch has the capacities of harm and care of love and the ultimate expression of hate. To receive touch is to be vulnerable to the possibilities of such expression. To receive touch doesn't ensure knowing which is which at any point in time, but intention can ring through for sure. It isn't the most rel reliable data point, however. The beautiful things in life, the pleasures we take for granted may very well be our undoing, our harm. Or as Jericho Brown opens in track one, Lush Life, quote, and Maida referred to this poem before. Um, this is the poem that opens the book, please. The woman with the microphone sings to hurt you. I don't know if he's talking about Sarah Vaughn or Natalie Cole or maybe even Queen Latifah, all of whom have recorded versions of this song, Lush Life. But Brown communicates its qualities of suffering, suffering in that good way of being done in by timber and sound and emotive artistry. The tools of the singer's trade, the, the microphone cord, quote, may as well have been a leather belt. This good pain in pleasure, the uncertainty of feeling, but surety of having felt something intense and enlivening. The microphone is not only a tool of artistic creation and expression, but of haptic intervention and violence. Alexander Wahelia would call this reading, quote, this kind of reading, quote, thinking sound and sound thinking, a practice of Black liber of Black literary collaboration or co-contamination um, with Black music and, uh, and literature that provides insight into the technologies of Black cultural production. These technologies are used to make acute affective response, perhaps transcendence. To be clear, Please is a book of poems signifying on an eight track tape and its player and giving us, promising us the pain and pleasure of black sonic transmission bold enough to hurt us, or at least to want to hurt us. The singing figure, the woman on the mic um, singing Lush Life, whoever she is, might have some black literary pre pre precedence. Um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar would name her Melindy and her voice as one that strikes your heart and clings. The Dunbar poem would repetitiously interchange the it as in the quality of her voice to hit an effort in transcribing the vernacular musicality of black language for sure, but with some hint of reflexive intertextuality as though the word it because the word it standard also appears in the poem. To be clear, the poem is about the peculiar and distinct quality of Melindy's voice, a voice that shames birds and stops accompaniment, the voice that, as Farrah Jasmine Griffin notes, is capable of casting spells and is also a voice capable of discreet and intentional harm. But track one, 
is not a warning of this. It's a promise, a trade and an invitation. The poem goes on, you drive to the center of town to be whipped by a woman's voice. You can't tell the difference between a leather belt and a lover's tongue. It goes on, she does not mean to entertain you and neither do I. Speak to me in a lover's tongue, call me your bitch and I'll sing all night long. There is within the listener, the reader, the object of love and the lover to be subject to this exchange, to be the subject to the voice that aims to maim the subjection of the voice into this particular form of service. Between the poem and the reader is an agreement of sorts. Let's be vulnerable, it asks. Vulnerability makes way for the possibility of friendly touch, of care, of love's ultimate expression, as well as violence. What Brown's poetry tells us is that there's not a clear line between either of these expressions in our world. That vulnerability is a space of making the, these expressions happen. And while sensation from vulnerability is promised, love is not. Track eight, Song for You. That's further on um, towards the end of Please, begins with the quote, bread or lightning, touch of an open hand. Another song, particularly beautiful for the distinct voice that is Donny Hathaway, is as much his personal story with a similar pathos of those begging tunes, if you think about it. I know your image of me is what I hope to be. I treated you unkindly, can't you see, right? This may not, this may be the song that is turned into full blast that the neighbor, that neighbors play while the sounds of a beating continue in the home of our speaker. Do not mistake this moment for a quote, taint nobody's business kind of love. The speaker lets us know, quote, I don't love him, but I do love this song. There is no love here. There is a song and the story tragedies it evokes. The poem references Natalie Cole's version, for which the image of her watching her son drown while she was on a drug bender and Donny Hathaway's self-inflicted demise. I know your image of me is what I hope to be, for sure. And that might be, that expression might be the faintest expression of love re referenced here at all, love's failure in the presence of violence. Violence is an ever present specter in love so that when it touches so so that when it when touch shines through as vulnerability, the reader braces, winces with the speaker toward the end of like father. This is the next poem in the collection. The scene is a father and a son um, in the morning time. The poem begins and ends with an embrace between the two. The poem is an embrace and all that that surrounds and is between the men is in this tender expression tinted though with violence. My father's embrace is tighter now that he knows he is not the only man in my life. He whispers remember when and I love you as he holds my hand hungry for a discussion of Bible scriptures over breakfast. The backhand of the previous poem that also made a reference this um, lingers here in the rhetorical violence of Bible scriptures, even as the embrace speaks softly, communicates the intention of love. Though this poem does not take up the musical themes of so many poems in the collection, its relation to track eight, its immediate predecessor in the book reiterates the limits of love and touch, how love fails tremendously. The father sings a pliant tune on in the poem. He begs forgiveness for anything he may have done to make me turn into an abomination. The hug is not a hug. It comes with a slap, it comes to hurt. While breakfast is cooking in this domestic scene, the embrace continues. But through this touch, the connection falls short. The speaker wants this hug with his father, approaches it as a son wanting to be seen, affirmed as a man with 
in a moment of vulnerability. The poem goes on, my father's embrace tightens, grits stiffen, I hug back like a little boy, gripping to prove his handshake. They are missing each other. Touch is so much and yet not enough. The poem continues, but I cannot feel his heartbeat and he cannot hear mine. There is too much flesh between us, two men in love. One cannot feel, one cannot he or hear, for well, the other cannot hear for the impediment of flesh. Flesh is will, the opposite of vulnerability, and skin, the barrier and object of vulnerability that result in touch without the fullness of feeling, without the connection that touch could evoke. Vulnerability is the through way from pleas to the New Testament to the tradition. The triad I have presented here in full force with his poem, Duplex Cento, the duplex as in the form he creates that closes his, the, the final, the, his latest um, and Pulitzer Prize winning um, collection, The Tradition. And I think I'll just end, I was going to read it, but I think I'll just end here. Um, in Duplex Cento, the theme of sickness envelops the possibility of touch where the burgundy car, the color of a rash, is a symptom of sickness both in the corporal body and the relation of love as, quote, none of the beating end where they begin. Any man in love can cause a messy corpse. There are no guarantees, but if I can reiterate, vulnerability does guarantee feeling. Here, love can be death, love can be sick, and still be love. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bettina. Um, I'm singing this song for you. Thank you so much for bringing up that message from Donnie Hathaway, because to me, um, he always touched me so deeply. And uh, the combination of the violence and the love, you, you nailed it. You nailed it. So we're gonna we're gonna close with uh, Opal. I'm sure he's going to bring us some wonderful richness to end. You mute mute it. Okay, there it is. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Uh, everyone, I'm so happy to be in this room with you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, it's always uh, an experience to hear Black women speak into conversations that we don't get to have with each other often enough in the same room. And this is how I'm feeling as I'm listening to Meta and Bettina uh, your wonderful, wonderful insights. Um, I'm also admiring the way that you put pictures up for us to look at while you're spe <laughs> speaking, which I didn't think to do, but uh, never mind. So this paper is called, Please, 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 Dreaming Inside of Pain. And I, speaking of echo, uh, there will be a lot of echoes in the way that I was trying to think about Jericho Brown's um, larger three volume commentary. And so that's what I've attempted to do. And I hope that it comes across because I'm going to try to get this in, in 15 minutes. So please, 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 dreaming inside of pain. I am a blues poet. That's Jericho Brown speaking to Honoré Fanon Jeffers. This is deep family business made of pain. And that is Yusef Kamenyaka in his essay, The Blood Work of Language, a review for Thomas Glaives, Among the Blood People. The blues as secular spiritual must surely be the first literature to explore the inner lives of black Americans. In its structure, sound, and interiority, we discover a complex philosophical positioning 
that insistently asserts pain as the thermostat of our living. If you can sing the blues, then you know that you have lived. When people claim not to like the blues, I assume they have never listened to a blues. When Joe Williams sings, every day I have the blues, there's something in his voice that toggles between regret and boast. When Bessie Smith sings, I hate to see this, the evening sun go down cause my baby he done left this town. Then she clarifies the situation with twant for powder and store-bought hair. The man I love would not have gone nowhere, nowhere. You might write your blues through tears, but the blues as Langston Hughes might say, are not without laughter. <clears throat> Yusuf Kamenyaka once called for a new blues. This was in Blue Notes in 2000. However, in the opening essay of, this, of his collection, Condition Red in 2017, our mastermind of poetry has a different color in mind. In an essay titled Red, he lays down a rap that is not blue, but blood. This prose poem chases aspects of the color of wound and tenderness. He says the insides of something. And he says we are in condition red. The body of poetry from Jericho Brown is soaked in the colors of flowers, song, and blood. My proof, the way that his volumes, each standing on their own, contain themselves the way that Gwendolyn Brooks's Satin Lex Smith contains himself, well-planned and complex on a Sunday. But as a trilogy, the books grow tendrils, reach out to one another, three trees in a forest. The opening poem in each of his volumes spares us like a bloody lintel at the first passing over, which is to say we hunker in the presence of death but are not required to die. These poems are like a conscious act of standing in pause, your life humming in your ears, each book an iteration of a question. What will we dare for this life, this life, for life? Will we settle for a change in key? Will we bleach the blood from our sheets? Three books, three portals, one dream. So I'm calling the opening poems of each of these books a portal poem. So please, opens with track one, Lush Life. And I'm only gonna read the, the opening lines. The woman with the microphone sings to hurt you, to see you shake your head. The mic may as well be a leather belt. You drive to the center of town to be whipped by a woman's voice. You can't tell the difference between a leather belt and a lover's tongue. A lover's tongue might call you bitch. Please. Beauty insists on suffering, doesn't it? And love. These poems come at you with their hot, cool, blues mouth concerned with the deep family business made of pain. Lush life. First track, you can't even say those L's and not summon the sweetness of Billy Strayhorn, whose name is not called here, but whose elliptical life and career is its own jazz blues improvisation on the kind of pain that lets you know you are in love. But Strayhorn is just a ghost here. The hot lash of sweetness, pain, and memory is on the tongue in the mouth of a woman and throughout this collection, we work the changes on please. Please is James Brown's begging on his knees, please. Or maybe you hear Minnie Ripperton's pure soprano melting ice cream cone, pleasing kind of please. Or you might hear a Negro police kind of please. Lush life. Once upon a time, it was a tradition to deny a child a name until the parents were convinced that the gods were not jealous and would, not, and would allow the child too, too beautiful to remain on earth. His birth certificate read, baby boy Strayhorn, until Billy entered school at five and his birth certificate was amended 
to William Thomas Strayhorn. Billy fought all his life, first against illness from birth, then against a psychologically and physically abusive father who thought him fey, waged an interior battle to assert his musical brilliance, so long obscured in the shadow of the Duke of Ellington. He did not hide though, he was unabashedly gay or as one would say at the time, homosexual. This portal poem seems haunted by Billy the man as singer and audience. But the poem, Lush Life, presents the blues as a woman wielding the lash of memory, love, pain, survival, bravado. A certain kind of power is what she wields. The poem closes, she does not mean to entertain, to entertain you and neither do I. Speak to me in a lover's tongue, call me your bitch, and I'll sing the whole night long. Lush life closes with an aside by the narrator. To whom? To us, those of us who are peering in, to a companion, please opens in a blues setting with a song to make you shake your head in wonder and surprise. How did I get over? The collection closes on the poet himself because my name is Jericho. In a painful narrative twist, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho becomes, as Audre Lorde might suggest, a new spelling of the poet's name. And this Jericho tells us I am not a city nor a saint, and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. I am curious about the meaning of the claim after 400 years of pain, of resilience. Many survived it, but what I ask do we mean by black resilience when we speak of black life shaped on the anvil of our flesh in the throes of identity theft, social and physical death, in the erasures of betrayal and invisibility under the law? Do we mean that black folk when bent bounce back, recover, or is resilience a word meant to riddle our traditions when we cannot even remember what made our reverences sacred. Proverbs 30 and 24 tells us, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Violence as a performance of love is sacred. There it is in the sacred text, the neat linking of violence, pain, and love. Do we know what makes a text sacred rather than artifact? indelible beyond challenge or doubt on pain of excommunication or charges of neglect or spiritual folly. Book two, the New Testament, portal poem, Colosseum. I don't remember how I hurt myself, the pain mine, long enough for me to lose the wound that invented it as none of us knows the beauty of our own eyes until a man tells us they are why God made brown. Then that same man says he lives to touch the smoothest parts, suggesting our surface area can be understood by degrees of satin. Him I will follow until I am as rough outside as I am within. I apologize for reading Jericho's poems because if you've heard him read these, <laughs> You know what they really sound like. <laughs> but to the text of the poem, perhaps it's a false memory. Someone telling me back in my childhood that the, the Bible's New Testament, the story of the birth and life and sacrifice of the man, God, Jesus, marked the renunciation of the old. That Jesus's delivery of love as the path, the redemption, had rendered that first testament old news, invalid, the markers of pain and revenge that began with the tricky tree of knowledge, the very suspicious presence of the serpent in a paradise, the weakness of Adam for pointing the finger at Eve, all very interesting, but alas, not God's best work. It turns out God had been working on a revision. No Adam this time, no Eve. The revision was Christ, part flaw, descended of Eve, part divine, God. 
Christ deployed via the womb of a woman to renounce the ancient eye for an eye, law of blood and death, torture and revenge. And yet the man God's song of love was booed at Golgotha, the site of his crucifixion named for the hill that looked like a human skull. Oh, Mary, Mary, don't you weep. I am grateful for Kamenyaka's observation that Brown's The New Testament is among other things, one part signifying the art of insult that when it hits its mark too straight made man blood. The blood work of language runs through this text beginning with the invocation of the Colosseum, the Roman arena where blood sport was a regular entertainment. Is it cunning or Brown's deep intelligence that likens the struggles of love to the life-death confrontations Romans viewed from the high rising stone bleachers. The very first reality TV in the flesh, Colosseum, the opening poem continues. Him I will follow until I am as rough outside as I am within. I cannot locate the origin of slaughter, but I know how my own feels, that I live with it and sometimes use it to get the living done. Because I am what gladiators call a man in love. Love being any reminder, we survived. To live with slaughter and use one's own slaughter to pursue one's living, such a recommendation must be held in awe, is what Christ knew, should make our ears ring to the quality of a love that has the power to bevel the heart. This work of testimony is a blood work of words, an extraordinary exploration of narrative, records, tales, testimony, words, meanings, and the visitations of story. The power of how we read what we read, how language enters us rough and smooth. The New Testament by Jericho Brown, rich in its investigations, of the manifestations of ourselves and our self-representations. So I ask, are the real housewives of Atlanta a sign of resiliency or wreckage? Volume three, The Tradition, Portal Poem, Ganymede, a story of loss cloaked in myth. <laughs> the man trades his son for horses. That's the version I prefer. I like the safety of it. No one at fault, everyone rewarded. The tradition, what is the intent of the article? There are many traditions, yet Brown seems to be pointing to something specific. The poem continues. God gets the boy, the boy becomes immortal. His father rides until grief sounds as good as the gallop of an animal born to carry those who patrol our inherited kingdom. When we look at myth this way, nobody bothers saying rape. I mean, don't you want God to want you? Don't you dream of someone with wings taking you up? The poet's investigation of the motives of the mythic formula Tales horrific in their content, their mode cool as marble. No blues guitar in the voice of myth, improvisation, perhaps. That's the version I prefer, says the poem's narrator, exposing the craftsman behind the curtain. No one at fault. The boy is made a favored slave, eye candy cupbearer for the gods. But what is the other version? that a boy is kidnapped from his father, a father who never ceases his grieving. When we look at a myth this way, says the narrator, what way? The way a myth is drained of the heat of blood and pain, cleansed of feeling, bereft of memory, gone missing the obscured voice. However, this narrator, it seems, cannot keep it together some kind of buried memory comes pushing through the smooth surface of the myth. 
Don't you dream of someone with wings taking you up? And when the master comes for our children, he smells like the men who own stables in heaven, that far terrain between promise and apology. No one has to convince us. This poem is so, so quiet. All the screaming is in the deep, deep psychic background, far, far away until the narrator pierces the dream. No one has to convince us. The people of my country believe we can't be hurt if we can be bought. Is Brown signify? A good master will make us safe is what the people already believe. Here's a version. At least in slavery, a man was worth his purchase price. When we look at a myth this way, nobody bothers saying rape. This is the version, the telling that we are supposed to prefer, that we do prefer. So what is your price? The free market is Zeus and no one is at fault. Your loss is a win-win. Condition red, thunders come in yaka. Red, the insides of something, an answer inside a question, an unholy thing turned inside out, left quivering in the last hour of Saturnalia. In three poems, each a portal to Brown's lush inner voice, we move from the secular sorrow song of blues, a blues structure of voice, repeat and improvisation, that performs sorrows to be shared, to make a lighter baggage, to make joy in pain, gesture to beauty. In the blues setting, the audience is a voice too, affirming the singer and her pain, and anyone singing the changes for that same song of pain, loss, leaving, of good love, good sex, good times, good food, a pig foot and a bottle of beer. Why we shake our heads and laugh and cry and laugh, and by the singer of pain, another one of whatever it is she's drinking. Brown's volumes offer us poems that catch up vast histories one body at a time, testing the conditions of passion and terror. As tri trilogy, the volumes together hint at a more troubling tradition afoot, that the myths narrated by the gods be not our blues truths. By the time we get to the title poem, The Tradition, we had better know something about a history of alchemy, science committed to the turning of lead into false gold. Billy Strayhorn ghosts, a flower is a lovesome thing, and tradition is fraught with flowers, blue aster, nasturtium, stargazer pink, foxglove purples, the white whites of baby's breath, flowers to lay on the steps of the Colosseum, curbside altars for the public bloodletting. The flowers are pastel, the poem is red. Here are just the closing lines of the title poem, The Tradition. Too late, sped the video to see blossoms, brought in seconds, colors you expect in poems, where the world ends, everything cut down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Mark Brown. Once upon a time, it was said black folk needed a new blues. The poet Jericho from the balcony of his French Quarter duplex sings with the lush mouth of a blues magician, his voice part, sign part signification, part rage, part riddle. What we may need is an old blues and a new tradition. We may need both dream and nightmare. What's the difference? Please. Thank you. Yeah. Please, 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 <laughs> please, you know what, <laughs> you women have conjured up this poet, mm -hmm. uh, the, where shackles become bracelets, mm -hmm. where wounds heal, where the song that is sung is Donny Hathaway's I'm singing this song for you. For you. And we become the backup singers for Jericho Brown. Jericho Brown has joined us. Please uh, show your face. You 
would have been amazed by the explication of the poetry that you've created. I hope you're there hearing us, Jericho. Um, these I hear women, you. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying are you to there? I am here. I wanted to, um, I was on my phone at first and I wanted to get to a computer because I think the battery's about to go out. <laughs> So just Glad I didn't second. know you were here. <laughs> just give me a second. I know. I um, I was really thinking I should change my name so that yes, so that this wouldn't happen. I should have changed my name. Yes. On, the, <laughs> on the link, I should have changed my name. Give me a second, and I will. Um, I'll be there. If y'all, I know y'all are. It's um, I know y'all have things to do, but I do have. Yeah, of course, I have things to say. I, and we want you to say something. And we know that um, the hour is spent. Uh, we Can I share something while he's yes, getting the please, time? Please. It's a screen <laughs> share because it's a provocation for you, Jericho. And for anybody who has far more access and contacts with me um, than I do in the art world. And the provocation is this. I'm a screen share and you'll see in two seconds what it is. Ah, ah. Give me two seconds. This is a fun provocation. Fun, fun, fun. Okay. Not yeah, we just saw you, Jericho, so you're good. Yeah, you're I'll good. Be there. Okay, yeah. I'm just doing this while you you're finding your 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 place here. Okay, so here yeah. is the provocation is this, and it's from a part of my slide, because I was trying to stay right in our time that I did not share that you all will now see. Do you guys see here? <laughs> where I have Kehinde Wiley, so Obama, and L. Ralphie yeah. versus is Brown. Yeah. Here's my provocation. Provocation one. I think Kehinde Wiley should do a portrait of Jericho Brown. <laughs> then we could do acrostic poems all about it. I just, I see it, right? I, I just see it, right? And, um, um, and so that's, that's provocation one. Um, and then provocation two, is this other artist um, that I collaborate with, Michael Ray Charles, right? Who did Every World is a Head, Every Head is a World. He has a whole series of these. Um, but what's striking to me is to think about, right? Like the way that Brown, it, see now that you're here, I call you my third name. Ah, I wish you changed your name. I know you're here because I'm talking third person. But the way there's this self-fashioning, right? that completely undoes, undoes and kind of subverts all of our heteromasculinist associations between flora and fauna, between the tradition and art history, between the tradition and poetry um, in this way that gives us a new world ahead. And so like, I just, I love this idea of imagining um, other artists kind of working with Oh, with 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 you Brown with your with your work so that was the provocation I I think you should you know you know go get your commission <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing well, now yeah. well I know there there are some questions out there I tell you this panel has been rich with art with music uh with language that is so so beautiful I, I'm I'm just glad you all were here to hear it you know glad to see you Akiba glad to see all those people Latorio uh Robin I'm, I'm amazing but Jericho you said you had a question uh or a comment so why don't you make it for us you mute it you mute it. I do have a, I do have a question or a comment, um, but I would like to uh, allow other people the opportunity to ask whatever questions they have. I um, hold on one second. I think I just. Um, Also, if I could make another connection, Dr. Akiba Harper was the dean when I was a student at Spelman. So I just want to oh. like all, all the love. 
<laughs> oh man, HBCU Love is here because we it's have wonderful. Our presidents, Dr. Akiba Harper and Dr. Daniel Williams, who also right like all HBCU loves in the house. <laughs> I love it. That's beautiful. Beautiful. And since I met UNC, Dr. Trudy Harris is here. <laughs> yes, indeed. George Moses Horton Poetry Conference when I first started out. We actually you were there, Joanne and Trudy. Okay, I think we're we, I was stalling to give you a little more time. Is he ready? Yeah. Yes. I'm ready. I'm okay, ready. great. Thank you, Maida, for stalling. Um, <laughs> I, I mean that. Big thanks. I uh, I have to say, um, and uh, you know, this would be the case, I imagine, with any poet. Um, hearing people talk about my work in this way is, uh, it is, um, it is humbling. Um, and it is, uh, it is a catalyst for my gratitude. I'm so thankful to all of you. And I see it's, um, uh, it's nice to be in a place where I literally know everybody's name except CLA media viewer. Uh, <laughs> and if it's not, and if it's, it's not because I, uh, and it's not because I've met everybody here, CLA webmaster, I don't know that person either. Um, but, uh, and I, I don't think I know DEF CON in JCU, but I might know Sonya D. But I just I just wanted to say um, it is a particular pleasure to hear this kind of work done by the people who I want to hear all the time anyway. <laughs> um, whatever y'all are doing, I want to know what y'all are doing. And so having you talk about my work in this way is a very special pleasure. I will never forget. Um, and I also just wanna add to that um, a word of congratulations to Bettina Judd, who just got tenure and has a movie coming out. To Bettina, um, Bettina's my sister and she's one of the best friends I have in the whole world. And I thank God for her every day. Um, <laughs> Maida and Opal, um, I, part of the reason why I was trying to lurk in <laughs> uh, is I didn't want to get teary eyed about any of this. Um, I have to tell, I mean, and maybe it's clear, maybe it's clear to you, but um, I admire y'all so much. And when um, Joanne Gabin brought me this idea, she said, who do you think would be good people? And I named Bettina, but I named y'all too, because I have so much admiration for y'all in real life. Um, Opal probably doesn't even know this, but anybody who hears me talking about Opal does know this. You know, whenever I'm around some of y'all, I kind of feel like, <laughs> like, what am I doing here? Why? I definitely, I have no business being around this kind of genius. Um, but I will always remember this and I am grateful for it. And I want y'all to know that it matters. Um, I want y'all to remember that it matters. I'm saying... I want you to know it matters and I want you to remember it matters because we're all doing the kind of work that people like to tell us does not matter. I mean, sometimes at our own institutions, in our own departments, uh, in our own colleges, uh, we get the sense that people don't think what we do matters. Um, but I know that what I just heard today is the kind of thing that saved my life when I was in my late teens and early 20s. I know it. I don't question that. Uh, in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And so the work that y'all did today is the work, is inspiring work, not just because of Jericho Brown. Mm -hmm. It's inspiring work because there is poetry written by, by Black people since the Black Arts Movement. And this crowd, this group, including myself, we have a responsibility if we are who we say we are, if we do what we say we do, we have a responsibility to shed light on those poems mm -hmm. and to spread them and our readings of them to as large an audience as we possibly can, particularly when it comes to Black people. Um, I'll finally say a big thank you to, um, to Dr. Sullivan Harper, uh, who's here uh, and is um, always a wonderful, uh, a supporter to me, Dana Williams, who's my co-conspirator in another project, um, McKinley Melton, who I love and who is absolutely amazing and who uh, said that this should happen, and Joanne Gavin. Uh, 
Joy and Gavin has a lot of good ideas and we've all benefited from those good ideas. She is a woman um, of wonderful ideas and she is also a woman of great execution. She doesn't just have the idea, she makes the thing happen and she makes it happen no matter what. I've actually seen it firsthand. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen at the very last minute where the idea looked like it wasn't gonna go through. And Joanne Gavin <laughs> took that extra step to say, oh no, we're doing it. <laughs> uh, somewhere between 6.50 and seven o'clock. <laughs> it looked like it wasn't gonna happen, <laughs> but Joanne Gavin made it happen. Uh, so Joanne Gavin is a wonderful woman of wonderful ideas. And uh, I think this is the best idea she ever had. So, <laughs> so I, just, I just wanted to say those things. I wanted to say thank you. Uh, but yes, beyond me, please. Um, I appre Part of the reason why I was hoping I wouldn't have to talk is I want people to read my poems when I'm dead. Mm -hmm. And I want people to read poems by Black people, whether they are here or not. The work Lucille Clifton did, the work Lucille Clifton does is work done on my heart for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I wish Lucille Clifton was here, but she is not. She is not here. But I got those poems and I thank God every day that I have those poems. And when I'm writing, that's what I want to make. I want to make something that you can have whether I'm there or not. Do y'all know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I don't want this to be about my thank yous. Anyway, so I'm going to shut up. And then well, people have questions or something. Yeah, no, uh, Jericho, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And, you know, mm -hmm. what you heard today, that tonight, was um, Black excellence at its clearance. I mean, those papers that you all did were just tremendous. And the way they interconnected, they intersected so well. You know, we, we didn't have rehearsal of this. We just, <laughs> I just put it out there and I said, okay, as Jericho said, I went for those people that he wanted to hear from. Talk about soloists who became backup singers because you have to harmonize if you're a backup singer. And we had some backup singers here tonight talking about Jericho Brown, but I also want to tell you, that it was McKinley Melton who made this happen, who made sure that he asked me to do this. And I'm so happy that we followed through in, in doing this. Uh, so I, I would like to, you know, take just one question or one comment. We, the hour is far spent and I wanna be respectful of your time. Uh, but I know there's one burning question out there and I just want to hear it. You may unmute and ask your question. I'll do it if nobody else is going for it. Hey, everybody. Hey, Dana. Hi, I worked from Dana. home today and did not comb my hair or put on earrings. So get over it. We family. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the pressure. Jericho says every time he sees me, I look like I'm just getting ready to go to brunch. So <laughs> not true today. All right. And then also because we have Jericho here, Mesa, you suggested that um, the duplex, and I was really fascinated by that yes. point that the duplex was kind of re- imagining or redirecting our understanding mm -hmm. of heteronormative home space. Yes. I just thought that that was so pitch perfect and smart. So I guess my question is kind of sort of also to Jericho about the naming of the duplex as yes. form and as style. Yeah. I think, um, and I've been uh, trying to figure out how to, I'm actually, I think maybe this is what I realized what I'm trying to write about recently. I mean, recently, like within the last 48 hours, okay. there's a way that, um, in the United States of America in particular, but maybe this is the fact of being black in the world. There's a way that we root for one another, even when we're rooting for one another in the midst of what we know to be um, very problematic trash. Do you know what I mean? Um, 
black people generally, I mean, I, I do believe this is true. We, do, we have a general distrust of institutions, even the ones we join, even the ones, <laughs> even, <laughs> even when it comes, you know, we pay our taxes like everybody pay their taxes, but we don't necessarily believe that the government is going to do something with our money for us. Do you understand what I mean? Um, black people get, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on a Zoom right now with black people who have all kinds of degrees, but that does not mean that they necessarily believe in the university as it has been set up and handed to us. Um, and that's at institutions that they went to as well as institutions where they teach. Um, and that's the case whether those institutions are predominantly white or HBCUs. Um, uh, you know, I'm not even going to get into Black people's relationship with institutions like the police. Do you know, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Uh, but you know, uh, we understand how our bodies work. So when we see a gun, we duck. Do you understand what I mean? So there's a way, and I was thinking about this a lot, um, particularly after the Academy Awards. Um, there's a way that, um, hold on one second. Sorry. Um, there's a way that there is a way that that rooting for each other has to do with the fact that we understand that no matter that no matter how much trash we got to deal with, we have to deal with the trash better than everybody else. Right. We want to see. I mean, y'all. I mean, this is as, this is like as simple as family family feud and going for the black family. Do you know I want them to win. Why do you want them to win? Because we're under some impression that their winning is our winning. Mm. You win on Family Feud, I win. You win an Academy Award, I win. You win a Pulitzer Prize, I win. You get that job, I win. Right? Um, even though it's in spaces where we might not ever really be able to win. You know, everybody I know was happy when Barack Obama was president or got elected president. Everybody I know, they were happy, but he was still president of the United States of America and we know the history of the United States of America. Okay, so now I said all that to answer your question, Dana. When I was thinking about the duplex, I was thinking about two-ness um, and not just Du Bois's two-ness, but also, you know, double jeopardy. Right. What is it about? What is it like to have several identities in one body? What is it like to be uh, one edifice with two addresses? You know, what is it like to have the face of a house, but to actually be two houses working with two families at once? And part of what I wanted to do with those couplets and with that amalgamation of form, those, you know, with the sonnet, with the blues and with the hustle, part of what I wanted to do is to show what it was like to be me. You know, I get called to the mat a lot about identity. People want me to be 66% black and 12% queer and 7% Southern, you know, as if there's some sort of a war in my body. But I don't think I'll, there's a war in my body. I think everything I am, I am 100%. Do you know what I mean? And so the, du the duplex happened in the way it happened because I wanted something that was that open as I think we are. Something that could be all encompassing. I also called it the duplex, duplex because of the repetition that one side is just like the other side. And yet what is happening on one side it is not going to be the same as what happens on the other side. So when that line of repetition comes up, the second time you get it, you're not getting it with the same meaning that you had the first time. So those, those are the kinds of things I was thinking about. And I'm from Louisiana, so I had to do something that would point back. <laughs> Fantastic. Yep, thank you. Well, you know, I have to say, this has been an amazing experience. I'm so glad this panel has been recorded. I want you to make this recording available so that those people who did not get to see it can see it. I think we should have it uh, for the uh, conference in 2023 uh, when uh, Jericho actually gets to be the keynote. It was an amazing experience. So Nada Duwa Jones, Bettina Judd, Opal Moore, 
I am thrilled that you said yes. And I'm thrilled, Jericho, that we followed through and we had this panel. Uh, I, I wish you all uh, just an exceedingly wonderful evening. I'm going to say goodbye because I know you all have other things to do. Dr. But Gabby, let Dr. me tell you, Burns. if you've never seen Black Excellence, you saw it tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And good night. I think McKinley wants to say. Okay. Oh, oh. okay. All just right. Real quick, I wanted to just jump in and, and thank all of our panelists so very much um, for, for everything that you all shared with us. Thank you, Jericho, for, for taking the time to come and visit. Um, I just wanted to take a brief moment to remind everyone uh, that the next CLA event is indeed tomorrow. We will be having our business meeting as well as a trivia night. Uh, there are additional member circle events that are upcoming. Uh, on May 10th, we will be having a panel discussion presentation on summer productivity. Uh, by Dr. Shanna Benjamin called The Pleasure Principle, uh, making the most productive summer possible. Uh, that is coming up in May. I wanna encourage everyone to please visit Member Circle Presents on the CLA website. And also while you are in the website tonight, if you have not yet voted, uh, please do try to vote by this evening as this is the close of the election. And on that note, I just wanna send a, a final uh, thank you as we prepare to, to change up our officers to our immediate past president, Dr. Donna Akiba Sullivan Harper, who will be uh, stepping off of the executive board, uh, and also to Dr. Reginald Bess, who is our outgoing president, who will assume the role of immediate past president. We thank you both for your leadership and everything you all have done for CLA. And just wanna say thank you all once again for coming through this evening. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully tomorrow evening for our business meeting and trivia night and back again in May for future member circle events. So thank you all so much. Thank you, McKinley. Thank you so much. What a wonderful event, wonderful. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye, Jericho. <laughs> Bye.